If you don't think you can afford health insurance, think again. Now more than ever, New Jersey is committed to making sure everyone has access to affordable health care and understands their options. Health plan rates are down nearly 10% this year, and we could help you find a plan that's right for you. You may even be eligible for financial assistance to help pay for your plan. But remember, open enrollment ends December 15th. Visit getcovered.nj.gov to get started today. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome. You're listening to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio with your host, Darren Batman McDuck. And now, prepare to get fat. Hey, 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 what's cracking? And welcome back to another episode of Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. I'm your host, Darren Fatman McDuffie. And this segment is brought to you by I'm the Fat Man.com. Wow, feels like I haven't been on the air for a long time. I think every time I skip a day and I'm not on the air, it just feels like it's so long. Um, obviously, we didn't do a show Monday because it was the 4th of July. I hope everyone out there had a great 4th and that. You enjoyed your family um, and that you got a chance to relax. A three-day weekend is always a gift. Anytime you get that extra day, you can relax and kind of de-stress and enjoy yourself. I've spent a lot of time on the beach and uh, got some sun in, got some waves in, and got a chance to kind of play in the water. The water was really warm here in South Florida. Um, If you ever come down and uh, visit, get a chance and uh, head out to the beach. It's always it's always uh, a great time. I um, want to just remind you, I always remind you of a show that I did last week. A show that I uh, did last week was with uh, Angelo Coppola, and we talked about the plant paleo diet, which is kind of a, uh, a morph out of the paleo diet, and Angelo kind of made the paleo diet his own, and he started something called a plant paleo diet. And if you go online or go to his um, website, rather, you'll be able to see where he got some really great results. Just speaking with Angelo last week, um, you can see that he's a very uh, astute, I would say astute guy, you know, doing all these studies and doing a lot of studying on the paleo diet and kind of making it his own. And uh, I would have to say that he's probably one of the people that I've had on who had the clearest voice, his microphone that he uses for his podcasting actually came off very, very clear. So again, to get a chance to uh, go back, please go back and listen to that episode, The Plant Paleo Diet with uh, Angelo Coppola. Tonight, um, we have a, a great guest on, a um, gentleman that I met in person. I was I actually, I, I always like to say I discover people, but I don't discover anyone um, I was scrolling through Facebook one day and then on Instagram, and I'm like, who is this guy that keeps popping up talking about autoimmunity? And uh, it happened to be Dr. Ronald Drucker, and we happened to be able to meet personally. He's right here in South Florida, and tonight we're going to be talking about his book, Code of Life. And then we're going to do another show, and on that show that we do in another month or so, we're going to talk strictly about autoimmunity and some great things that he's doing with patients who have autoimmune disease. And I know that that's kind of exploding. A lot of people are having issues with autoimmunity. And we're going to do a specific show just dedicated to talking about autoimmunity and what he actually does to help patients who come in with that type of issue. So let me read Dr. Ronald Drucker's uh, bio before we get him on here. Dr. Ronald Drucker is a natural healing practitioner with over 35 years of experience in the healing arts. He also has over 18 years of experience in eliminating autoimmune conditions. Dr. Drucker believes the immune system is a highly sophisticated doctor within the body who always knows the effect, knows the effect path to healing, provided that the tools for healing immune modulating agents, which we'll probably get a little bit into tonight, are present within the body. Dr. Ronald Drucker, welcome to Perfectly Healthy and Tone Radio. How are you tonight? Oh, hi. How are you? Doing great, doing great. You and I met in person, and great to have you on. We sat in Starbucks meeting uh, one weekend and talked for a good number of hours, and you shared your story with me of how you started helping people uh, to get into better health. But I wanted you to kind of share your story with the audience and let them know um, about your journey and where you came from and, and where you're going. 
Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, well, when I was 19, I decided I wanted to become a uh, medical researcher. I wanted to find the cures for diseases. You know, when you're 19, you're kind of idealistic and you think you can do anything, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I enrolled in a medical technology program in a, in a teaching hospital, and um, I got to do cancer research, and I, and I got to do laboratory work, and I got to do diagnostics, and I learned an awful lot about disease. I even used to stay late at night after the lab would close, except for emergencies. And uh, you know, I'd look at the uh, the pathology slides. I'd go to the medical library and I'd put them under the microscope. And I used to look at just—I mean, literally thousands of slides over over that year or so I was there. And I learned all this about disease. But I noticed they didn't know much about health. In fact, so many of the things they did in hospitals were actually antagonistic to people's health. They, and I, I, I got very frustrated. I actually got ulcers working in hospitals because I realized that despite all they knew about disease, they didn't know much about health. I mean, people were suffering and dying needlessly. Um, Mm -hmm. The attitude was terrible. Uh, I'll give you an example. One day I get a requisition for a test called the Bench-Jones protein. Well, that's a test. If it's positive, that means the person has a type of blood cancer. Well, of course, I was concerned. So I go up to the floor, and who do I see but this nice lady? I'm I'm 19. She's probably about 35. And her husband and her two, two nice, two really beautiful kids are there, and Obviously, they're all concerned. So I get the test, and I go back to the lab. We're on the test. Well, it's positive. So, you know, right next to the lab, there's the pathologist's office. You know, he's supposed to be the doctor's doctor, right? If you have a question, you go to the pathologist, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I go in there. I knock on his door. Come on in. I walked in there. I said, hey, Dr. So-and-so, you know, um, that that woman in room such-and-such, and and she's got a positive Bench Jones protein, and that means she has multiple myeloma. What's going to happen to her? He says, she'll be dead in two years, and I get out of here. I'm busy. Well, the next day I got psychosomatic ulcers because I was so frustrated at that attitude. I mean, that was a terrible attitude. They mean to tell me there was nothing they could do to help this woman? Well, Mm -hmm. the truth is, medically, there really wasn't. But that doesn't mean that that nature couldn't help her. If she went on a better diet, maybe she detoxified, maybe, you know, she got some help from other people, whatever it was. But no, not not a word about those things, you see. So that kind of got me going, and... uh, after I left um, hospital work and diagnostics and research, I went and I became a chiropractor. And at least that way I couldn't hurt anybody. And, you know, I could still do my research. I could still learn and, you know, take courses. Uh, and uh, then, then what happened finally 22 years ago, a patient came in and he had a severe case of ulcerative colitis, which he cured himself of using this crude preparation of immune modulating components. And frankly, I didn't even know what they were at the time. But, you know, with my background in research and whatnot, I I kept searching and researching. And I also used them on the worst patients I could find. I mean the most difficult patients I could find. And miraculously, they all got better. And like I say, at first I didn't understand why this was happening. But uh, doing research and after 13 years, I finally read uh, wrote my book called The Code of Life, which I know we're going to talk about tonight. Mm-hmm. And in the book, I explain, um, you know, what the problem stems from, what we can do about it, some practical solutions, and um, people seem to love my book. And, uh, you know, that's basically how this all started. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. Um, you've been doing this for, what, 35-plus years. Has anything change do you think the public is actually uh waking up now at this this point in time well you, you know you know i think that's a great question i think that well, yes year, many years ago when i started out the public was very unaware it's almost as if they knew about you know if they had a problem they might go to the emergency room or their doctor but they really didn't know too much about alternatives people would ask questions oh what about vitamins or you know and maybe they would take some vitamins but they really weren't that aware now people are much more aware Um, And they're more open, I think, to alternatives. Um, And, of course, the need is even greater because there's more more disease right now than there ever has been. There's more diabetes. There's more cancer. There's more heart disease. There's more autoimmune disease. I read an article recently that one in seven Americans has a diagnosable autoimmune disease. And that doesn't even include immune suppression, which means probably about one in five Americans have some kind of immune disorder. And, frankly... If you don't have the proper nutrients in your diet, and nobody does hardly, even organic food doesn't have it like it used to anymore, uh, sooner or later your immune system is going to break down. Um, 
so it, we're really in a in a tough spot. And then not to mention all the things we're doing to hurt ourselves, like all the toxins and poisons and the crazy things they're doing to our food supply. And you know, most of this I go into in my book, of course, in great detail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, getting back to the book, and you just mentioned diagnosis, and one of the things that I I came across while when reading the book and and really researching and preparing for the interview is that. Fifty percent of diagnoses are actually wrong. Can you talk a little bit about that? <laughs> well, you know, I, I say it's the blind leading the blind. I actually teach a course for, to other healthcare professionals called Laboratory and Differential Diagnosis because that was my background. Of course, was di- was diagnostic testing, and I, of course, I've stayed up with it. Well, you see, what happens is, is this, it's the old expression: if you don't know what you're looking for, you're never going to find it. And you see, because. You have to. I'm not opposed. Don't get me wrong. I'm not opposed to emergency medicine. You know, if you're in a terrible car accident, you get a heart attack, or your appendix is about about to burst. You know, you you need to go to an emergency room. You need medical attention, and sometimes they can save your life. But when it comes to chronic ailments, they don't have a clue. And you know, I'll give you an example. I'll give you the typical example of a diagnosis. So, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. Now, that's a real fancy name. Sounds like they know what they're talking about, right? But break yeah. it down. Idiopathic, idiot means they don't, is, do, 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 you, that you don't know. So idiopathic means they don't know where it comes from. Uh, thrombocytopenic means you don't have enough platelets in your bloodstream. And purpura means you've got these purple blotches all over your body. Now, you've seen some of these elderly people or these people on these anticoagulants uh, or other drugs, and they've got these, these purple blotches on their body. Mm-hmm. Now, the truth is that that's one cause is from medications, but another one, it's an autoimmune disease, too. So, and, and there's, no, there's no medical cure for autoimmune diseases. But I'll give you another example. What about something like, say, GERD? They say, oh, well, you've got acid in the digestion. You have to take these antacids or these proton pump inhibitors. Well, yeah, but how do you know it's not alkaline indigestion? Have you run the tests? No. You see, they haven't run the tests. Okay, it's irritating, but maybe it's it's irritating because the contents of your stomach doesn't belong <laughs> regurgitating up into your esophagus. But all the antacids in the world aren't going to cure that, you see. So it's kind of like, okay, well, I got a diagnosis, but then what do I do? And that's assuming you even got the right one. Or let's say somebody goes to the hospital. They have an acute attack of high blood pressure. You know, they got the headache and they feel dizzy, and they go to the ho- they go to the hospital. Oh, you got your blood pressure is 200 over 150, or whatever it is, right? 220, let's say over 150. So okay, mm-hmm. well, they give them medications and they bring the blood pressure down. But what's their exit diagnosis? Hypertension, blood pressure. Well, excuse me, what kind of hypertension? Why do I have the high blood pressure? What do I do about it? Well, take these drugs. Well, drugs don't cure anything. You see, it's this crazy, vicious cycle. So my approach is let's find out what the cause of the problem is, if we can, and let's do what your body needs to heal itself up. Only nature heals. Uh, you, you ever heard the name Florence Nightingale? Yes. Yes, I, you know, yeah, she's, I, I've known of her, and I've, I've read in the book you, you mentioned Florence Nightingale as well. Yeah, well, Florence Nightingale became famous during World War One and thereafter because she was, she was an army nurse, and she was the most famous army nurse. In fact, she's considered the mother of modern nursing. And she says, and I quote her in my book, only nature heals. And mm-hmm. it's true. There's no drug that can heal anything. In fact, I, here's another quote from my book. If you take a drug long enough, it will give you the very disease for which the drug is being prescribed. Yeah, I remember that. And uh, you see a lot of that with the elderly. It's like they're taking, you know, one pill for this, and then next thing you know, they're taking another pill for something else. And then next thing you know, what they had to begin with actually becomes worse. And then before you know it, they're taking another pill for something else that they just now developed. So it, it's become um, crazy. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is you use a term that I like very much. It's called biological monkey wrenches, where you talk about <laughs> synthetic. Yeah. And um, talk about that. Talk about synthetics, because a lot of people don't know um, about the body and how it reacts to uh, synthetic, oh, yeah. uh, especially medications and or synthetic vitamins and minerals and some of the stuff yeah, that well, they're you taking know, for you know, health. You know, it's, you know, it's funny. Sometimes uh, some of these pharmaceutical companies, they'll run experiments and they'll use a vitamin and then they'll prove the exact opposite of what the vitamin really does. But if you look at the details, let me give you an example. Say vitamin E, for example. What everybody knows, vitamin E's are terribly important, good for the heart, it's an antioxidant, it has all sorts of wonderful benefits for the body. Uh, 
Well, they use a synthetic form of vitamin E that is really, you shouldn't even call it vitamin E. They can get away with it because it's got the same number of carbons and hydrogens and oxygen in it. But its structure is different than natural vitamin, D, vitamin E. And therefore, when they give it to you, it actually makes you deficient in the real vitamin D because it's, uh, vitamin E rather, because it's attaching to the same receptor sites, but it's blocking the function of the real vitamin E, the natural vitamin E. You see. So, Sure, you take enough synthetic vitamin E, you become vitamin E deficient. Next thing you know, they say, okay, vitamin E doesn't do you any good. In fact, it hurts you. Well, <laughs> sure, because they're blocking the, they're blocking the real vitamin E. Uh, they did an experiment with, uh, with cholesterol, with eggs. They said, oh, well, cholesterol is bad for you. Well, what they do? They took egg yolks. Well, egg yolks have cholesterol. But what kind of egg yolks did they use? They used powdered egg yolks. Well, powdered egg yolks are oxidized. They're rancid. Well, you feed rancid oils to anybody, of course it's going to mess up their cholesterol and their other blood lipids, you see. They didn't use fresh organic eggs that were poached under proper conditions, you know, with a nice, nice healthy breakfast, you know. You see? So, yeah. so, so, so this is how crazy it is. So you want, you want to try to get natural vitamins. You want to get, of course, whatever you get in your food supply. So unfortunately, some things you cannot get in your food supply anymore, even organic food. And that's, in fact, that's why... People say to me, well, what do I need to take the immune modulators for? Well, if you could get them in your food supply, it'd be fine, but you can't anymore. See, even organic food is hybridized. In other words, they're using seeds that are selected for certain qualities, uh, appearance, shelf life, sugar sugar content. But see, if I don't know if anyone's ever gone, to, gone up in the mountains or in the woods and they've they've harvested some wild berries or wild fruits or whatever, you know, they're nothing like what you see in the supermarket. If you, mm -hmm. you know, notice how you go to the supermarket, they all look the same, you know? <laughs> all the apples look the same. All the, everything looks the same, right? It's because they hybridized them. This, this, mm -hmm. this, when, as soon as you hybridize a seed, you take away these things that, I call, that are called phytonutrients, means nutrients that come from the plant kingdom. Well, in the immune modulators, there's over 200 phytonutrients. Many of them you can't get in your food supply anymore, and they're essential. You got. You have to. You have to have them to be really healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to get to talk. Get to talk a little bit more about the immune uh, modulators, and uh, not meaning to cut you off, but you just mentioned something that's kind of a great segue. I wanted to ask you about, um, and that was essential, because we're hearing a lot about essential nutrients. Um, and in the book, you talk about essential, non-essential, semi-essential, and then also I wanted you to maybe talk a little bit about the RDA, um, when it comes to these essential nutrients, for instance, when we are looking on the back of our food and we see zinc at 5% and iron at, you know, whatever percentage there, and the government is recommending to us that these are the recommended daily allowances. When we are talking about essential nutrients, is what they're recommending what we actually need or do we need more? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Well, if you look at the way they come up with what they call the recommended daily allowance, this is how they do it. They'll take an animal like a guinea pig or a rat, and they'll withhold one particular vitamin or mineral or whatever it may be. And then they'll see that that, that animal gets sick. It develops what's called a nutritional deficiency disease. For example, if it doesn't have enough vitamin C and it doesn't make its own vitamins, it's like a guinea pig doesn't make vitamin C, just like we don't. So they'll withhold vitamin C from the guinea pig. When the guinea pig starts to bleed, gets signs of scurvy, and, and, and looks like it's going to die, what they'll do is they'll start slowly putting vitamin C back into the diet. As soon as the symptoms of the scurvy disappear, they say that's the minimum daily requirement. They just double that, and they say that's the recommended. But, you know, you don't just want to walk around and not have scurvy. You want to have enough vitamin C to, you know, keep your immune system strong, keep your connective tissue strong, uh, you know, uh, all the wonderful benefits of vitamin C, which are innumerable. Um, and, of course, obviously, it's way more than just the lack of symptoms, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. Health is not just the lack of symptoms. Health is an optimum state of functioning. Uh, so, and of course, that's what they do with all of these things. So, the minimum daily requirement or the recommended daily requirement, which is double the minimum, is usually woefully um, uh, way too low. 
Uh, and then, of course, you know, when you have certain conditions. I'm going to give you an example. You know, I don't know if you ever did this, but I've done it. Years ago, I'd say I'd get the symptoms of the cold or flu or something. I would just take a handful of vitamin C, big drink of water, skip dinner, go to bed. Next day, I didn't have the flu or the cold or whatever it might have been. It's because that vitamin C temporarily boosted up my immune system so high, it just killed those bacteria or viruses. You know, and of course that's another thing. What do the medical people do? If you have the symptoms of the flu, you go to your doctor. You know, you're achy. You got the headache. You feel, you know, you feel terrible. You got a fever. Um, they give you an antibiotic. Well, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense because the, everybody knows the flu comes from a virus called the influenza virus. Now you know, you know, antibiotics have no effect on viruses, but they're still giving people antibiotics. I mean, it's 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 ludicrous. Um, so, and of course, what, what's happening is now they produce these superbugs, you see, because pe- because they've overused and abused antibiotics. Do you know that more anim- You know that farm animals take take more antibiotics than human beings in America. Yes. And now they're producing all these superbugs. Well, and that's another wonderful thing about the immune modulators because they actually kill the superbugs. It's amazing. It's they're more. It's more effective than 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 antibiotics. Because, see, the antibiotics have become... See, what happens is, okay, so you get a strep throat. Well, that's the strepto... Stre, the, uh, the, those are the strep bacteria. Well, you take an antibiotic. The antibiotic kills 99% of those bacteria, right? You may even feel better. But you know what happens? The 1% that's left over, because they're resistant to that particular antibiotic, it's your immune system that kills the last 1%. If it doesn't, they got to use another bacteria, uh, another antibiotic on you, excuse me. And then, of course, now they're making that resi- resistant to the second one. So eventually, when they keep doing this, now you have a, a strep or, a, or whatever, some bacteria, that, no- that normally could have been easily taken care of. Now it's resistant to 10 different uh, or 100 different uh, antibiotics. Now you've got a superbug. Now you've really got a problem. They created yeah. it. Yeah, I, I mean, in my past life, I was uh, a farmer, a farmer rep, and I always tell people this. And one of my main product lines was antibiotics. And I remember just uh, going in and seeing a doctor one day, and the FDA was sending letters around telling them to make sure that it was an, in fact, a bacterial infection before using antibiotics. Because, like you said, yeah. a lot of them were using antibiotics on viral infections, which have no effect, and also end up. Uh, where the causing bacterial resistance because they're using it on something that is actually not supposed to be used for getting back to the question on essential nutrients, uh, non-essential and semi-essential from oh, yeah. what I get, ga- from what I gather from the book that even though we maybe scientifically, scientifically throw these terms around essential, non-essential, semi-essential, it seems that, At the core of all this is that everything is essential, because I remember in the book you make an example that's saying some semi-essential nutrients for children turn out to be essential, that children really need these to function properly, to have uh, mental cognition. Yeah, Yeah, that's absolutely right. See, see what happens is that the reason they'll call something semi-essential, for example, is because the theory is that if you have some of what's called precursors. In other words, you have some of the components in your diet that if under the right circumstances, your body has all the right enzymes and does all the right things, that your body can convert those, those they're called precursors, those ingredients into the final product, which now is essential. So they call it semi-essential because, well, supposedly your body can make it. But what if your body can't make it? What if you lack that enzyme? Or what if you don't have the components that you need to make the essential? So really... It's it's just a play on words because eventually that thing well, that substance that those things are going to wind up becoming is essential. You see, but mm-hmm. the, but why? But see, but more importantly, why do they use a term like semi-essential? It's because they're discouraging you from taking vitamins or minerals or or nutritional supplements or improving your diet because if you do, you're going to be healthier. <laughs> you're not going to need the drugs. It, it, it's it's really it's really just. It's really antagonistic to people's health to use terms like semi-essential. Uh, yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of, lot of forces out there that don't want us to be healthy. Well, it's, it's, it's very funny that you're, you're mentioning this because, 
I mean, even maybe for maybe within the last couple of months, you always see these studies that are coming out. And we talked briefly about the studies at the beginning of the interview, how uh, they're used to, quote, unquote, maybe promote a different agenda. But you see so many studies out saying that vitamins are worthless and uh, that you don't really need any vitamins. Um, So it it just seems like it's a lot of propaganda out there, and people really don't know uh, what to believe. And so, I mean, in my personal experience, when people seem to have confusion and they don't know what to believe, they pretty much should sit still and don't do anything. Yeah, well, of course, there's powerful economic forces that, look, if people if people ate all healthy things, they took all the nutrients they needed, they lived a more stress-free life, they kept themselves, you know, detoxified, they didn't drink chlorinated water, fluoridated water, fluoride toothpaste, uh, to all these poisons that they're consuming, they'd be so much healthier, you know. Uh, but there are economic forces that don't want that. So it's re- it's really just propaganda is what it is. It's it's kind of ludicrous. I mean, I mean, uh, whose grandmother didn't say you know eat vegetables or even take cod liver oil or whatever? I mean, you know, uh, the g- your grandmother loved you. You know, she wasn't telling it to hurt you, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I mean, and and if you go back further, every every culture in the world. They had people, whether they were called medicine men or whether they were called, you know, whatever herbal, herbalists or whatever, and they were they were always they they passed down this knowledge from generation to generation. How come all of a sudden, in a couple of generations, we've lost all this wisdom? You know, I had a friend of mine in college. He was uh, he was an herbalist. His grandfather from Italy taught him how to go out into the woods and identify and gather herbs. They would use those herbs in their dinner or their meals. You know. Uh, and, uh, you know, he used to, he was a fantastic cook and boy, some of the stuff he made was fantastic. And this guy was strong as an ox, you know, yeah. but, um, but you know, it's, it's almost as if we've just gotten so far away from nature or what is, or even, just even common sense, you know, um, I'm going to throw something out at you and you can say yay or nay about it. But um, this is something I came across in another book, and I'm coming across it again in your book. And when things seem to come at me in twos or threes, then I know that there is some essence of truth to them. But one of the things I came across in your book um, is that all disease kind of begins at the cellular level. How true is that? Oh, well, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because, you see, every cell in your body has a cell membrane. That cell membrane determines what enters the cell, whether it's a nutrient or oxygen, what leaves the cell, whether it's a waste product or carbon dioxide. Even an endocrine gland cell has to release its hormones directly into the bloodstream. Well, it's got to get through the cell membrane in order order to do that. So basically, the cell is where all the real action in the body is occurring pretty much. you know, it, it, take insulin, for example. You know, people say, oh, well, insulin regulates blood sugar. Well, it does. But what it really does is it facilitates the transport of all nutrients, not just uh, sugars, not just glucose, but vitamins, minerals, enzymes, you name it, everything, right into that cell. This is why when, you get, uh, when people have diabetes and they get neuropathy or they go blind or they have circulatory problems, it's because their, st- because their cells are starving, because the insulin isn't doing its job. They have what's called insulin resistance. That's type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance diabetes. And then, of course, some people don't even make enough, enough insulin, and then they call them type 1s. Well, most type 1s is an autoimmune disease. Even a lot of type 2s are autoimmune disease. Now they have a new type of di- diabetes called Alzheimer's disease. It's literally called... <clears throat> Autoimmune type three brain diabetes. You can look it up. Yeah, because yeah, that's come because up. the brain is starving for new. In fact, the brain is this. You know that not just the pancreas makes insulin. You know the brain makes insulin, and the brain utilizes a lot of insulin. And if it's and if you have insulin resistance, you're more likely to get Alzheimer's disease, among many other diseases. So mm-hmm. here again, you gotta you gotta you gotta eat right. You gotta you've gotta um, get those. Get that, keep that immune system working properly. Uh, another another action of the immune modulators is that they increase insulin uh, insulin sensitivity. I, I should say, in other words, they 
It's the opposite of insulin resistance. So this is why many diabetics, they take it and their blood sugar normalizes without, without even taking the drugs. Or they can get off yeah. the drugs. Yeah, to the audience, we, we're going to get to the immune uh, dial uh, modulators. I know he keeps saying that. We'll get to it. Um, so here's here's one caveat, and this is something that you changed my mind about when uh, I was reading the book. Uh, one of the things that I had kind of an inkling of, but I never really gave it a lot of thought, is that you mentioned diabetics uh, specifically, um, that when someone's type 2 diabetic, they put them on insulin. And I've come across this, this theory as well for people who are constipated. A lot of people who are constipated tend to uh, want to use laxatives. So the body will start depending on these things outside of itself in order to kind of regulate what it needs to regulate. Um, why is that? Why does the body do that? Well, here's the thing. If you take something from the from the outside whether i don't care if it's a laxative i don't care if it's insulin i don't care if it's uh, thyroid hormones you mm -hmm. there's a feedback mechanism in your body and your body's going to start to either become dependent on that or it will stop making its own so in the case of say insulin for example if you take these either these drugs that rate and force your your pancreas to make more insulin or just give you the insulin directly you're actually suppressing your own body's ability to produce insulin Furthermore, as you know, being a drug rep, or a former drug rep, I should say, that you know that insulin is um, it's not natural. I mean, they used to get it from, from pig pancreas, but now they, now they get it through uh, genetic engineering. And you know that, that your body eventually is going to recognize it as a foreign substance, and then you develop an autoimmune attack against, against the insulin that they're giving you. And the same is true of gamma globulin shots. The same is true of, of all sorts of things that they're using. You know, the first time you take it, it's effective. But the thousandth time, you're in trouble. And then, then, then they have to keep increasing the dose. Then you get more antigen antibody reactions. You get more inflammation. I mean, it, the whole thing becomes a gigantic mess. See, see drugs, drugs basically should be used for emergencies. Or mm -hmm. if there's absolutely no other uh, choice. You know, because they, they, they can prolong your life and they can give you pain relief and they can have beneficial effects. But in the end, they're not going to cure anything. They're just treating symptoms. Now, okay, there may be some, there's some cases where it's absolutely necessary, like in an emergency, or if, if people don't know any better, okay, at least it keeps you going. But my approach has always been to try to find something in nature, something natural, that will accomplish the same thing as a drug without any side effects, without any toxicity. And because it's a natural substance, your body can use it the way it's supposed to be utilized. I mean, we're part of nature. So, um, you know, people should really think about it. You know, they, you know, first of all, when you're taking it, look up the side effects. Look up the contraindications and say, you know, gee, do I really want to do this? Or maybe there's an alternative. Maybe there's a better way. And today we're so fortunate. You've got the Internet. You can look things up. You can Google things. Um, you know, it used to be tough to find this information. Now it's easy. Yeah, it's just one of the big parts of my job when I was in pharma is reading package inserts. And I was kind of startled to see how many people get a drug. You know, you when you go to pharmacy, they give you a pamphlet to read, and many people don't even read it. They just end up, you know, taking the drug, which is, which is scary because you don't know how it's going to affect your body and drugs affect everybody's body different because we are all, we all have different body chemistry. Oh, um, sure, sure. I mean, but that, that brings up a very interesting point. I actually read an article once and the article was actually written by a mathematician. In fact, he was a, I think he was a statistician as well. And what he said was, if you look, you take a certain drug and it has, let's say, say it has half a dozen side effects. And then you take another drug and that one has a dozen side effects. And then there's a certain interactions between the first drug and the second drug, right? And then you take a third drug, and that has 10 or 20 uh, side effects. He says, when you, when you look at the mathematical combinations of all those different possible side effects, he says, once you get the three drugs, it becomes literally impossible for the human mind to make enough calculations to possibly figure out what are the possible interactions of those three drugs. And some people are on half a dozen or more. So there's no, there's no doctor in the world whose mind can, e even assuming that they were that, you know, that they monitored the, the patient that carefully and that they really did all their homework and everything, this, it's impossible. 
absolutely impossible. So it's it's just a bunch of guesswork. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, drugs. Are, you know, my dad used to say he was a dentist. My dad used to say, "Never forget, sugar and every drug is a poison." Hmm. And boy, I'll have that to remember that one. <laughs> I'll have to remember that one. Um, talking about cellular nutrition and uh, specifically phytonutrients. You mentioned phy- phytonutrients earlier in the interview, and uh, I wanted to get a little bit more in depth into that and then start getting into the, uh, the immune modulators. But um, why are phytonutrients so good for our cellular nutrition? Well, you know, here it, it's, it, you know, the, when I started looking into this term phytonutrients, all it really means is it means phyto means plant and nutrient means some, something of, of value to the human body or to, you know, whatever animal you're considering. So these are, these are substances that nature has pr- been providing for probably millions of years. Uh, you know, of course, assuming that, you know, the soil is right and, the, you know, there's enough rain and it's the proper temperature and all that good stuff for the, you know, for, the, for, this, for this plant to grow. But under normal circumstances, it pr- uh, I mean, a, a carrot produces over 800 nutrients. An organic carrot, if it's grown properly... When they analyze it, it's got over 800 ingredients. Now, most people will say, oh, well, you take carrots for beta carotene. Yeah, but what about the other 400 carotenoids uh, that are related to beta carotene, or maybe it's 250, but whatever it is, you know, not to mention the minerals and God knows what else is (laughs) is in that carrot. You know, uh, yeah, I actually read one time that an organically grown carrot has 800 nutrients in it. Now, that's one, that's one vegetable. So the plant kingdom has provided thousands and thousands of these essential nutrients that are are called phytonutrients, nutrients that come from the plant kingdom, uh, that we've been consuming for millions of years. All of a sudden, we're now going to eat food that's grown with hybridized seeds, with when the, they only put three nutrients back in the soil, it's got almost no minerals. It doesn't even have the nitrogen-fixing bacteria that are, that 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 are essential for the for the proper growth of these uh, these uh, vegetables and fruits and whatnot. Um, you know, we got pollution. We got water that's contaminated with arsenic. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, by the time you get these foods, and now GMOs are even worse, of course. You know, they're so lacking in in so many of these nutrients because the plant can't make all these different nutrients if it's only getting three different uh, artificial fertilizers. I think they what they use they use nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, right? Well, what about the uh, what about the 24 essential minerals that we need? You know, um, what about what about having a healthy soil? What about in the old days when they used to the farmers would they would literally they grow a crop like alfalfa, which had deep roots, and it would pull up all the minerals and all this valuable material from the deep soil, and then they would turn it over. They wouldn't even use the alfalfa; they would just turn it over and let all that wonderful nutrient nu- nutrition go back. And then the next year, if they grew corn, let's say for example, that corn now it was really fantastic corn. Now it had all the minerals and all this other great stuff that they would they would that it could absorb now from 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 the uh, from the alfalfa that was grown the year before. But farmers don't do that anymore. So the food today doesn't have it. Even organic food doesn't. See, there's no requirement for organic food to have organic fertilizer. They can say it's organic if it hasn't been if they don't haven't used pesticides on that land for 3 years. Okay? Uh and and they're not using artificial fertilizers. But that may mean that may mean they're not using any fertilizer at all. You see, so uh, if, if you look if you look at the assay of organic food versus uh, commercially produced food, it's it, the nutrient value is not that different. You see, because because yes, it's better because at least you're not getting those those poison you know the, 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 all, all those poisons. Right. But you but you have to supplement today. You have to and you know um, you know and, and every year. If you look at like the Journal of Nutrition and all these other uh, scientific uh, uh, journals out there, they're talking about all these nutrients and they're finding new new physiological and beneficial effects of all these different nutrients, whether it's a vitamin or a mineral or maybe a plant pigment. And they have many different names. In my book, I go into all the different names of all these different categories of nutrients that you don't even hear about, like anthroquinones 
or flavonoids or flavones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's dozens in my book. And, and now when the scientists take these things and they experiment with them, they find, oh, my God, this one, uh, this one improves your eyesight, and this one helps your circulatory system, and this one prevents this disease, and this one prevents that disease, et cetera, et cetera. And now you realize, hey, it's not just a handful of vitamins and minerals that we need. We really need these things from the plant kingdom. And there's yeah. thousands of them. Um, when the cells are not communicating properly, there's cellular uh, starvation. That's the word I'll use. We're not getting the right nutrients. Uh, you mentioned something in your, your book, and uh, the cellular and immune communication deficiency syndrome. Uh, am I right by saying that that happens because our cells are not getting the proper nutrients, so therefore they can't well, communicate properly? Yeah. Well, yeah, That's it's really fascinating. The more and more I looked into that, the reason I called my book The Code of Life, because if you think about it, a code is sort of a, you know, there's letters, and then there's syllables, and then there's words, and then there's sentences, and then there's paragraphs. Well, mm -hmm. in order for, let give you an example, the immune cascade. So, you know, you're walking along, and you get some bacteria, and you breathe it in your nose. Well, the, the nose has a mucous membrane. Well, that mucous membrane has something called immunoglobulin A in it. Well, immunoglobulin A initiates the immune cascade. In other words, it's the first step to preventing that bacteria, which is now you're breathing in, from actually creating a disease. So then, then another, then a cell comes along because it's been it's been labeled with this with this globulin, this immunoglobulin A, and that cell, it's called a macrophage, and then that now will literally ingest and digest that bacteria, and then it will make more antibodies and et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line. So you never get sick. Well, what's doing that are these are these are these are these um, these cellular identifying molecules and these communication molecules? See, if you look at the cell membrane, the cell membrane has things called glycoproteins and glycolipids. Glyco means sugar. Lipid is obviously fat, and protein is protein. And it also has other carbohydrate molecules. Now, these are not starches and sugars like the, like, you know, like you know, from a from a birthday cake. These are complex comp, uh, carbohydrate molecules. Yeah. And what they do is they literally identify your cell as being you. So when so when one of these immune cells comes by, it it's not going to attack you because it's going to re it recognizes you through these through these cellular cellular communication molecules, most of which have a carbohydrate component. Like I say, it's not a sugar or a starch typically, but it's a more complex sugar. But but but. But nevertheless, these identifying molecules now are preventing autoimmune disease. They're, and, and also, because there, there are other communication molecules that are in your bloodstream, they are, they're, they are directing these cells to, let's say, an invading bacteria, virus, fungi, parasite, or even a malignant cell, for example, or even a toxin. Furthermore, there's a process called chemotaxis. Well, chemo means chemical and taxis means movement. So these chemotactic agents literally direct the cells of your, of your immune system, which, by the way, the only way your body heals up anything, I don't care if it's a cut on your finger or a major surgery or it's a bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic infection or, or any disease, the only way your body heals it is through the immune system. There is no other part of your body that heals it. So, so these communication molecules are literally directing those cells to do their job, to go to this place. When you, have it, when you smash your thumb, you're out in the backyard, you smash your thumb. Okay, it hurts like the dickens, it blows up, it gets, you know, it's, you know, there's blood under your fingernail, and eventually, you know, the fingernail turns black and falls off. But, you know, a month later, you got a new, you got a new finger there, right? You know? It's because, it's because when you injured your finger originally, your immune system sent these, these cells because of those communication molecules, sent, sent the cells to that area, and they cleaned up the, the dead blood and the dead tissue, and they started repairing things with fibro, fibroblasts, laid down new connective tissue, and ma made new blood vessels and all the rest of it. And now you got, that's healing. But when you have chronic inflammation, you see, there's a miscommunication in the body, and the body's constantly creating this inflammation. Well, where does the inflammation come? It only comes from one place, and these are these immune cells. In other words, they're overproducing these inflammatory chemicals like histamines, like um, cytokines, these pro-inflammatory 
um, compounds which are now considered to be the basis of virtually every disease that there is. So if you have to have the proper communication from cell to cell, from tissue to tissue, throughout your entire body, and if you don't, you're in trouble. Yeah, I wanted to ask you this because this was uh, kind of intriguing to me uh, with regards to the immune system and the liver. Um, so the liver actually produces antibodies, and in some roundabout way it helps with um, our immune function, our immune system. Oh, sure, sure, sure. The, um, the liver produces uh, immunoglobulins. These are those liquid proteins that, as you know, when when they when they are when your body is sensitized and it produces these specific immunoglobulins, those globulins will go and they will attach themselves to a bacteria or a virus or some abnormal tissue or some invading organism, and that way your immune system knows to send cells to destroy that particular whatever it may be bacteria, virus, fungi, parasite, whatever. And and so, yeah, of course, the liver is terribly important in that regard. So in, in, in regards to that, this is what I want to ask. Um, there's a lot of people out here who have suboptimal liver function. They're, you know, they're congested, they're toxic um, because they're pretty much eating the wrong things. A lot of stuff is in our environment. So I'm guessing, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or right here, this is how things connect in my mind. Um, if they're already starting out with suboptimal liver function because they have not done any type of detoxing, of their body, is that already weakening their immune system? Well, sure, because, you know, the liver, might, it has so many different functions. There's literally thousands of enzymatic reactions in the liver. The liver is detoxifying virtually every toxin you come in contact with. It's producing immunoglobulins, which are these liquid proteins that protect you against disease. Um, it's regulating your 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 cholesterol level. It's uh, it's 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 doing so many so many different functions. And sure, and yes, and that, so besides the fact that the liver is under a toxic burden, you know, with everything from drugs and pesticides and you know toxins of all types. And look, your own body produces toxins. You know, mm -hmm. you have to get rid of them. That's why you're urinating out you know toxins. Why you're sweating out toxins. Uh, that's what the large bowel's doing. The skin, the hair, the nails are all excreting. Even your breath excretes toxins. So, so, um, so yes, the body has to detoxify. The liver is considered the major organ of detoxification. It's literally a chemical factory that takes toxins, it neutralizes them, and then excretes them through the bile, uh, through the through the bile, you know, which is, which of course is excreted into the small intestine and then eventually out of your body. So. Um, Liver function is terribly important, so I, I'm a big believer in detoxifying the liver, keeping your bowels working good. Uh, you know, I'm not opposed to maybe having a drink once in a while or something, but you know, you want to—if you overdo it, you're going to hurt your liver. And I don't care whether it's alcohol or a drug or a toxin or whatever. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I remember when I first got into pharma, um, one of the things that they taught us there was that every drug that you take has some kind of pathway that it, got, it has to go through the liver, and then you have which we talked about in the interview, you have people who are taking several different drugs at a time. So it's placing a large amount of burden on the liver, and they don't really really uh, know that that's what's actually happening because the liver has to filter that stuff and, and kind of detoxify. Um, getting into immune the immune modulators, from what I gather from the book is that aloe, tends to be, I want to say aloe, aloe vera, tends to be that perfect food that for some reason it just helps the body. Is that where the immune modulators are, are derived from, the components well, of aloe? Uh, well, yes, but, you know, it's like anything. There's different species of aloe. It's grown, mm -hmm. It can be grown under different conditions, different soil, different uh, environments. Then, of course, it has to be treated properly to, to retain the the uh, the quality and the quantity of these immune modulators. Um, when you get the right species of aloe vera, when it's grown under the right conditions, when it's minimally processed without any preservatives or without excessive heat, light, or anything else that can destroy these very sensitive and delicate, very long chain uh, molecules, uh, which are the immune modulators. In fact, there's also another term called the immune orchestrators. And it's hmm. funny because if you think about it, that term immune orchestrator, it's really a, meta a metaphorical term because an orchestra, you know, has like, you know, 
there's you know there's the there's the string section and there's a percussion section and there's you know all that so and well, well what is it it's the immune system is literally being orchestrated by these long chain uh, polysaccharide molecules that are found in very high concentrations in the immune modulating components, which which do come from aloe vera. The problem is that in the aloe vera plant, it's 99% water. Some people say 99.5% water. So it's only the 5%. They have to be concentrated approximately 200 to 1. And they have to be done it has to be done so under very pristine conditions. You can't let bacteria get in there. You can't let heat, light, uh, chemicals. It has to be very, very pure and very, 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 um, a very precise process to retain these immune modulating components and these, these, immu- these uh, healing orchestrators. But when it's done properly, yes, the aloe vera plant contains over 200 phytonutrients, uh, which your body requires. In fact, you know, it's, I don't know how many people saw it, but uh, have you seen the latest version of Exodus uh, at, at the movie theater by any chance? Uh, no, I haven't. Well, uh, you know, it's an interesting story. You know, it's about, you know, Moses is getting thrown out of Egypt and he's wandering in the desert. Well, it shows Moses eating the inner gel of an aloe vera plant. There's mm-hmm. actually a scene right in there. And why? Because it's a survival food. Well, it's a survival food because it has amino acids, it has vitamins, it has minerals, and it's loaded with phytonutrients, and it's loaded with, the, with also water, but in addition, these immune modulating components. So at least according to, to the story, one of the reasons Moses survived in the, when he was wandering in the desert was because he was eating the inner gel of, of aloe vera. It was keeping him healthy and keeping him alive. Yeah. Um one of the things that I, I really found out from your book is that aloe vera is very good for our digestion. And digestion seems to be that one thing that kind of keeps us young. And in the book, I think you, you mentioned that even most people are over the age of 15 have digestive problems. Um, why is digestion so important? And why is well, the, the, yeah. the aloe such a good, I, I guess – a synergistic match for the digestion process. Well, yeah, because uh, because of its functions, um, the 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 concentrated um, immune modulators from aloe vera and the phytonutrients from aloe vera have have many many physiological functions. For example, let's say somebody has ulcers. Well, they're producing too much acid. Well, the immune modulators actually have a buffering effect. They don't completely destroy the acid the way an antacid does, or these proton pump inhibitors, but it modulates, it buffers, so it brings the acid down just enough, so you don't it is so the your your stomach is not digesting itself with this with this over overproduction of acid, and but you can still digest your food. That's just one example. Um, other components, like I say, increase insulin sensitivity. So now, you know, now you're going to absorb your nutrients better. Other components incorporate themselves into cell membranes. Other components re- increase the healing process. In fact, I've, uh, there's a number of uh, research articles that I quote in my book where they would give um, aloe vera concentrates to people who, for example, had chemical burns or who had wounds or who even had radiation burns, and they would heal up faster because these immune-modulating components directed the immune system to heal up those damaged tissues. Well, if you think about it, what's the gut is really the, you know, the di- digestive tract. It's, it's a big, long tube with a semi-permeable membrane um, which has a mucus coating that protects it. I mean, if you didn't have that mucus in your stomach, you, you, everybody would have ulcers, you know. Uh, the immune modulating components contain something called mucopolysaccharides that actually increase the body's production of this protective mucus coat that we have in the lining of our nose, in the lining of our de- digestive tract, the lining of our um, uh, urinary tract, etc. So, you know, it has so many, so many, it, it supports so many uh, essential processes in the body, whether it's the immune system or whether it's wound healing. 
or whether it's uh, protecting us from bacteria, viruses, fungi, parasites, abnormal tissues, whether it's cellular communication. It, it just goes on and on. All, all of this is documented in my book, by the way, with, with scientific references. Um, and if people want to email me, uh, I can even send them more information on this. Um, I, I know it's a little bit much to sort of grab all at once because it's, it's almost like saying, well, this is a panacea. It's almost like, almost like it's good for everything. Well, I'll be frank with you. It's not good for everything. You have a herniated disc in your back, and it's pressing on a nerve. You know, you probably need surgery. You know, the immune modulating components are probably not going to, you know, take the bulging disc off your nerve. But guess what? If you do have to go in for surgery, it'll help you heal up quicker after the surgery. Mm-hmm. Let's say you had bone-on-bone arthritis. Well, it's not going to regrow cartilage when there's no cartilage there to, you know, to begin with. So that joint, you know, maybe you need surgery on that joint, or maybe it's just not going to get better. But the ones that are not completely destroyed yet, those can be salvaged because your body can now heal them up. And like I say, when the immune system normalizes, the inflammation goes down, the destructive process stops, and your body has the ability to heal because, again, the only thing that heals your body is your immune system. Uh, by the way, 80% of our immune system is right next to the gut. They're called Peyer's patches. They're these lymph nodes that line the uh, human uh, digestive tract. And um, further, you know, and there's another interesting factor about the about the human gut. Besides the fact that we have literally thousands of species of friendly bacteria under normal circumstances, um, which are, of course, keeping the pathogenic bacteria um, uh, population down helping us digest our food, helping us create B vitamins, uh, vitamin K, um, even uh, certain essential fatty acids, which are very protective and necessary for us. But um, um, uh, I was going to say that um, uh, that the health of the, di- of the digestive system is so fundamental to the health of our entire body. Even even serotonin, you know that 80, 80 to 90% of the serotonin that we make, which is a neurotransmitter, it's a feel-good hormone, is made in the human gut. It's not made in the brain. And if you think about it, the medications they give, all that, it doesn't, doesn't affect the, uh, the uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, increase the production from the gut, which is where 80 or 90% of it comes from. It only, it only maintains a higher level in the brain. And then, of course, there's side effects. Why not just get your gut to produce more of it through a healthy digestive tract, and you won't even, and then, you, then the ten or twenty percent that's in the brain is going to is going to be trivial. Yeah, one of the things that I, I came across in the book, and um, we'll kind of close it down here in a little bit, but um, is that if you have too much serotonin in the brain, that's why you that's why uh, the the mental conditions come about, like Alzheimer's and others. Is that I, I remember reading that while I was uh, preparing for well, the interview. Well, yeah, well, absolutely. The, 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 what, they're, well, they're, they're called neurotransmitters. And the, mm-hmm. the neurotransmitters, like I say, most of them are normally produced in a healthy body, like in a healthy mm-hmm. digestive tract. When, when, you have, uh, when, you have a health, when you have a normally functioning immune system, you're going to have more normal levels of these uh, neurotransmitters. Um, uh, like I say, a lot of these people are getting n- neuropathies. Their neuropathies are coming because, for example, with diabetes. Like I say, if you, if you don't have insulin, a proper insulin sensitivity, you can't use the insulin. The insulin will not permit the proper um, influx of nutrients into the cells and then you wind up getting neuropathy the nerves are literally starving to death mm-hmm. so so one of the things the first thing i i uh, that i get people to do is to stabilize their blood sugar in a healthy range at least that's going to stop the um uh, at least that will slow down if not stop the neuropathy furthermore when you when the cell membrane is working better because it's it's functioning properly uh, the nerves are going to have the proper nutrients, just like all the cells of your body are going to have the proper nutrients. It, it's really a fascinating study because once you get into this, you realize how one thing affects another, which affects another, which affects another. You know, it's almost as if if one thing, it, it's like like with hormones. If one hormone isn't being produced properly, 
Or if you have an autoimmune attack, let's say, I'll say with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example, hypothyroidism, and the and your body. Your own body, your own immune system is attacking either the thyroid gland or the thyroid hormones, and therefore they're not functioning properly. Even if you, even if they, you know, you can run the blood test, they're there, but they're dysfunctional because your immune system is in, is inactivating them. Then next thing you know, this poor person, other, they're going to have other hormonal problems. They might get a, they might get adrenal insufficiency, or they might have, if it's a woman, she may have menstrual uh, irregularity, et cetera, et cetera, because all of those hormones are working in a coordinated fashion under normal circumstances. But when you destroy one or you limit one, it, it has an adverse effect on all the others. Yeah, it's it's very holistic. Um, Dr. Ron, I didn't want to keep you over an hour, man, and I know we could we could probably speak for two hours, and then I'm like, okay, well, let's save something for the autoimmune show. So I'm going to have you back on uh, probably within – maybe say a month or so, maybe sometime around September, October uh, time frame, and we'll talk more about autoimmunity. But I think that this was just a great call to understand or interview rather to understand uh, a little bit more about the immune system and actually what's what's going on. But um, we'll do that other show about the the autoimmunity here in the, in the months to come. You mentioned your email. If people want to know a little bit more about the immune modulators and the aloe, what's, what's your email so I can put that in the show notes? Oh, sure. Thank you. Well, the best email for me is my last name, a Drucker, D-R-U-C-K-E-R, at D-R-R-O-N, D-R-U-C-K-E-R.com. So that would be Drucker at drrondrucker.com. Also, there's some wonderful information on my website, um, which is just uh, drrondrucker.com, drrondrucker.com. People can call me directly. Uh, My phone number is 954-547-0487. Uh, 954-547-0487. I'm happy to speak with anyone. I don't. I don't. I. I I'm not going to give you medical advice. I'm not going to give you personalized medical advice. But I can certainly show you how to get healthy. I can d- point you in the right direction. I don't. I'm certainly not going to charge anyone. I'm not their doctor. But I'm more than happy in sharing and educating uh, information to the public and even to other healthcare professionals. Cool. Dr. Ron, thank you so much, man. I can't wait to have you back. We talk a little bit about autoimmunity, and me and you are kind of planning at some point in the future to do a a live interview, which we'll be putting on YouTube as well. So looking forward to that. Have a great evening, and uh, thanks for being on tonight. Oh, well, thank you, Darren. I really appreciate it. Thanks uh, thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Dr. Ronald Drucker. We talked about the code of life, uh, which is his book. And you know what? I forgot to ask him how to get the book. So <laughs> I will uh, actually go back and ask him and put it in the show notes for those of you hey, who may want to uh, get the book and read a little bit more uh, about the immune modulators and talk a little bit more about uh, the aloe. So I will definitely go back and uh, ask him how to do that and, and, and go back and kind of tidy up the show notes, so to speak. So you'll be able to get the book, but I'm sure if you contact him, uh, he will tell you how to, to get the, the book. Um, I got a free copy, so I'm not sure. I, I always say go to Amazon and it's probably located on Amazon, but I'm going to reach out to him just to make sure. Sorry about that. And then um, getting ready to go to South Carolina, uh, tomorrow for a little bit. Um, I had my godmother who passed away. who was just like my second mom. She helped me out a great deal when I was in high school and uh, she passed away suddenly. So I'm going to be uh, going there, but uh, we will have the show Monday. I'll actually prepare for the show in South Carolina, my hometown of Sumter. And uh, I'll be back Monday, Monday afternoon, early afternoon. And uh, I, I don't even know who we, we are having on, um, I want to say uh, Stanley Fishman will be talking about tender grass fed beef. I think that's who it's going to be. So uh, don't quote me on that because I don't have the schedule sitting in front of me. I have to go in and and get it, but I think it's going to be him. I believe that's the the 10th and I believe that's him. So join me same fat time, same fat channel Monday 
Uh, Stanley Fishman and I will be talking about tender grass-fed beef and tender grass-fed barbecue, which um, I've fallen in love with grass-fed beef and want to know how to – some more cooking tips. There's some lamb cooking tips. Lamb is probably my favorite meat, so we'll be talking a little bit about that. And uh, tune in if you like meat, if you like grass-fed meat like I do. It will probably leave your mouth watering. So, again, thank you for listening. I'll see you Monday, same fat time, same fat channel. Peace and love, y'all. Good night. Sure, you're healthy now, but health insurance isn't about now. It's about being covered for the unexpected. When an accident or injury happens, the last thing you should worry about is how to pay for your health care. GetCovered.nj.gov can help you find an affordable plan that's right for you. You may even be eligible for financial assistance. But remember, open enrollment ends December 15th. So visit GetCovered.nj.gov and find a health plan that keeps you covered, no matter what life throws at you. If you don't think you can afford health insurance, think again. Now more than ever, New Jersey is committed to making sure everyone has access to affordable health care and understands their options. Health plan rates are down nearly 10% this year, and we could help you find a plan that's right for you. You may even be eligible for financial assistance to help pay for your plan. But remember, open enrollment ends December 15th. Visit getcovered.nj.gov to get started today.